Baci. Per un'altra casa, Hello everyone. So we are really going to start now. And actually this time I will not be the moderator because I have a different function. But uh, to start with, I am Leah Shortino. I am the founder and director of C Junction, and C Junction is this public venue uh, you see, which focuses on all kinds of emerging and current issues related to Southeast Asia. And today we have a very important topic because it's the book <laughs> which I have been the leading researcher and editor and contributing. So, of course, I am very biased. Uh, to say that this is very important and I am very thankful for you all to come. From now on, uh, the moderator will be Kunpia and he will introduce the speaker, including myself. So from now on, I say goodbye as uh, moderator <laughs> for a while <laughs> until I will be back as speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Leah. Um, my name is Piya. I'm from Chulalongkorn University at Faculty mm -hmm. of Medicine, and it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, I'm very glad to see many of you here on this, like Leah said, very important topic, not just because she has a book, but of course, we were all impacted in one way or another by what happened before. And before we start with introducing our speakers, may I use this opportunity to invite, invite our uh, uh, guests to give a welcome address. So we have three important guests with us today. Uh, the first one is uh, Ms. Satakamon Panit, who is from the National Research Council of Thailand. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good, good evening, everyone. Um, and Rian, uh, Professor Dr. Ming San Khao Saad, uh, Program Chair of uh, Khon Thai Si Chut Soon, and uh, Associate Professor Dr. Um, sorry, <laughs> uh, Ari Jampaklai, Director of ISPR Mahidon University. Um, on behalf of National Research Council of Thailand, I am very delighted to have uh, this opportunity to uh, express my um, pleasure in providing our uh, support to the um, pro uh, research project uh, that form to the foundation of uh, the book, uh, uh, Who Cares? COVID-19 uh, uh, social protection response in uh, Southeast Asia today. Uh, for the funding of uh, National Research Council of Thailand, uh, we take uh, great pride in fostering research and um, excellence and promoting collaborative efforts that delve into the social issues affecting Thailand and our uh, wider region. By providing funding and resources for this endeavor, we aim to contribute to a deeper understanding of the complexities and challenges uh, faced by our society. So uh, this book that um, is as a testament to the, de the dedication of uh, research researchers and um, the editor to <clears throat> uh, who have worked tirelessly to bring forth new insights and perspectives on social protection response in uh, the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I extend my appreciation to uh, the researchers, editor, and everyone who involved in the, this project and um, your collective efforts have produced a work that holds great value and contributes to uh, the wider discourse on social science uh, in Thailand and our region. Uh, as we gather here today for the launch of this book, uh, let us appreciate the collaborative uh, spirit that has brought us uh, together 
uh, made this publication inspire further research, uh, facilitate meaningful discussions, and ultimately contribute to uh, positive social change. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, I express my sincere uh, uh, pleasure in representing the National Research Council of Thailand and being part of uh, this event. Uh, and congratulations to all involved. Uh, and may this book um, launch mark, mark the beginning of uh, many fruitful conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kap Kun Sat. May I invite Professor Dr. Ming San Khao Saad, uh, whom I met for some time, and she is leading a very important research program on Kuantai 4.0 from Chiang Mai. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and colleagues and friends. Can you hear me at the back? Okay, good. Um, I have a very short speech, but Leah said it should be even shorter, so I will cut it into half. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this important meeting to launch this book, which addresses one of the most pressing issues of our time, COVID-19. The editor of this book, editor and author of this book, uh, Professor Rosaria Chortino and her international team have put substantial but rewarding effort in producing a book uh, which will be a very important piece of evidence and reference for policy design for now and for the future. Through this book, we will, through this book, we will see how the pandemic has further deepened and widened the inequalities in our society, as well as reveal the profound gaps in social protection. I believe that COVID-19 also has a very, is a very important factor in changing our uh, political landscape. Uh, I cut it short. So we go to, may I remind you that social protection is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And we cannot afford to wait until uh, the next crisis strike to act. It is time for us together to design a social protection system that leaves no one behind. Uh, this beautiful book, of course, is supported at the National Research Council of Thailand and uh, under the Kontai Si Jutsun research program, which aims at promoting integrated research studies on economic, social, environmental, and political issues. I'm very proud to present our first book, on our common and global issue. And I am very grateful to Leah and her team to do such a wonderful job. Thank you. So let us give her a big hand. Thank you, Krab Ajahn. And uh, another short remark, may I invite uh, Associate Professor mm -hmm. Ari Jampaklai, the director of IPSR Mahidon. Thank you very much, Ajahn Pia. Uh, and um, good, should I say a good afternoon or should I say a good evening? Uh, so good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to this um, very special event. Um, ladies and gentlemen, at the Institute for Population and Social Research or IPSR at Mahidol University, we focus our mission on impactful research. So we are very greatly proud of um, the research on COVID-19 social protection response in Southeast Asia, which is the base of the book, uh, Who Cares, being launched today. So first of all, I'd like to congratulate Ajahn Rosalia for uh, initiating and successfully leading this project um, along with her excellent team, uh, Kun Bom Latapon, uh, Kun Jong Sawapak, as well as other support staff um, um, of both C Junction and IPSR for making great team effort in completing this significant project and producing of the strongly recommended books of as one of the major outputs of this project. 
on behalf of IPSA, I would also uh, extend our appreciation to the National Research Council for Thailand um, for funding this project, Ms. Ms. Satakamun, who is presenting here. We are grateful for the continued support um, of the NRCT. I would also like to acknowledge Professor uh, Ming San, um, the chair of the Peerhead strategic plan on social aspects, Kontai 4.0. I believe the project and IPSR owe a great deal um, to your invaluably, invaluably and professionally being the focal point uh, for the program, which uh, this project is part of. And my special thanks go to the team of the outcome delivery unit for Kontai 4.0 uh, project at Faculty of Economics, Chiang Mai University. I am aware that um, working on a contemplative study and producing a multi-country book chapter is tr uh, truly a challenge. So I would really like to commend all researchers and colleagues from Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Singapore, Vietnam, and definitely Thailand. The two researchers of the project from Mahidon University are uh, with us here, Dr. Tiranung of IPSA and Dr. Um, Rocky Pan of Faculty of Public Health, Mahidon University. So this is one of the best examples of multi-country teamwork and the valuable experiences of researchers should be shared and learned. I got a chance to um, skim a little bit at the introduction and I believe that the informative contents of the book are priceless. So many things about COVID-19 and experiences and responses we are to learn. So this book offer us, offers us documents emphasizing the social context, particularly in, equitably, in, in, in equality and injustice contingent on how the pandemic has implications for the uh, well-being and safety of various segments of the population. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about the book from some of the others this evening. And once again, congratulations to all contributors from all partnering countries for the great success of the project and for this very exceptional book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kav. Well, I think we have heard a lot about, about the book, no? how, how good it is, how interesting it is. As a critical listener, we are not sure we need to listen to the real stories, right? And, and I think we would go directly into the presentation. We have today three very special uh, presenters. The, the book actually covers six countries and the regional perspective, but today we only have uh, three speakers with us here. And then also in addition to the three speakers, we have another uh, uh, discussion commentator who will also start off and then we will have time for us to also uh, ask questions and, and also discuss further. But the first person, of course, is no need for introduction, I guess, uh, Associate Professor Rosalia Chortino from both Mahidon University and Chulalongkorn University, and Si Changshan, of course. Yes. Thank you, please, uh, Rosalia. Yeah. Yes, but for sure a little bit emotionated because this has been This okay, so this is working. So I was saying I am a little bit emotionated because indeed this has been the work of more than two years and what started as a one year project, Ajahn Min San is always giving some challenging task of doing a regional project in one year time, including two publications. This is the English and there will be a Thai publication with also a photo exhibition in September. So, but still, I think we have a race to the challenge and here we are. Thank you to all uh, the contributors to the book. And there are also two in the floor, Ajahn Tiranong and Fabio Zaini is also there in the back. He contributed to the Vietnam chapter. So that said, I will present today uh, just one of the chapter I contribute, which is the regional uh, chapter. And basically is meant as an overview. So this uh, 
project was started in April 2021 until December 2022. It covered from the beginning of the pandemic up to, in the sense we have done a literature search from the beginning of the pandemic until December 2021, and some chapter go a little bit beyond that. So basically it focused on the first two years of the pandemic. It was undertaken, as said, by IPSR, uh, which I was the lead researcher. Thank you to the contribution of the National Research Fund and, of course, of Con Contai for Zero as the project. It was meant to explore and to give an overview of a social protection response during the COVID. We were in the middle of the pandemic. I want to stress this. This was during the Delta pandemic. We were not expected. We started in April and that was the worst period for the COVID pandemic. It was meant for a multi-country effort to assess the scope of national and regional policy, as well as independent efforts, philanthropic efforts, as well as individual efforts, which, as we know, have been extremely important uh, to provide uh, welfare to the population. It is meant as an exploratory qualitative research to systematize existing knowledge so as to build a systemic base for future intervention and policies. I will not go into the methodology uh, today for uh, I mean, the time is limited, but you can read extensively in the introduction. The objective here again was to understand better what was going on and to map and analyze what kind of responses were given to the economic crisis which was affecting this region because of COVID-19 as well as the containment measure that were taken. Uh, this is the content of the book. I will not go uh, into detail, but I will present only the first chapter which talks about the paradox of social protection in Southeast Asia, and you will see why it's a paradox. And this is the sections, again, I will not talk about all of them, but these are all the sections that you will see. So from the epidemiology of the pandemic, how it spread, which groups were affected to the socioeconomic impacts and political impacts that were a consequences of that uh, crisis of the pandemic pandemic, and then what measure government took uh, to deal with these impacts and as well as the community themselves. And where are the gaps? So this is the trend, but just we know that COVID, the perspective of the book is what everyone now say, that the pandemic is the great revealer. It has shown problem that already existed before. So the problem we are talking today about inequities are not new, but the pandemic show very well what are these uh, inequities and which groups are affected. Our perspective is that COVID is more than a pandemic. It is a system, a tumbling of precarious system because we live in a very unsustainable way. So it is a multiple synchronous failure at the same time. We are confronted, which is called by Orton in the Lancet, using a sociological term, the syndemic, in which biological and social affect each other. And we have seen it very clear that the condition, the social condition play a very important role in vulnerability as well in the capacity to respond to the pandemic. We realize at the end of the book, and this is, will be the main uh, conclusion, that to overcome the crisis, we cannot just only have technocratic approach, small solution here and there, but we really, we need to think out of the box about what kind of labor market system we want, what kind of social protection system we want, which go well beyond what now in politics you hear a lot, an allowance of 300 baht or 500 baht of 3000 baht. That is not the main issue. But let's start from the beginning and the pandemic. Uh, this region was the first affected 
after uh, COVID outside of China. The first case was in Thailand. The second case was in the, the dead. The first dead was in the Philippines. This because this region is, of course, very well connected with China through business and tourism. Initially, except for Indonesia and the Philippines, it seemed everything was going relatively well. It was not spreading as fast. It was not spreading as fatally. It was not causing so many deaths as in other parts of the world, including Italy, my own uh, country. But this changed radically in the second year. By the late spring and in the summer of 2021, we saw a dramatic spike due to the arrival of the Delta variant, increased mobility because by then government were mostly tired or not consistent with lockdown measure, etc., and low vaccination rate. As you know, this was a big issue in Thailand. So what were the inequities? They start with the containment measures themselves. Prevention measures were based on middle class assumption that everyone would have house to work from, that everyone would have access to alcohol and mask and vaccination later on, which of course was not the case. They were inequitable in the way people was decided who would cross the border and who would not. So we see refugees stopped from Myanmar because they would, could bring COVID, but they could have been subjected to the same quarantine measure, but that was not the case. The same with the Rohingya going to Malaysia, for instance. And also in terms of tourists, it was decided which one were allowed in and which one were not allowed in. The way the measures were taken, like bubble and seal, that was for meaning uh, entire quarters were closed, totally closed in a military terminology, bubble and seal of migrant settlement, construction site, urban slums. That was done in Thailand, in uh, Malaysia, as well as Singapore, but was not done, for instance, in Ekamai, even where I live, also, who even when it become a not spot of COVID. There was no effort to close that area out. Large malls, mini markets remain open, but mom and pop stop shop were closed, parks were closed, fresh, fresh market. So all the small peddlers were closed, but the bigger economic interests somehow got some leeway. Uh, the punishment for those who didn't comply was mostly for low class people, while the VIP, even if they made quite a lot of transgression, as it came out from a survey of ISAs in Singapore, there was uh, for sure all over Southeast Asia VIP committed transgression, but they were tolerated in the way they did. And we see inconsistency. So. Lockdown, but then elections. We had election in Indonesia, we had election in Malaysia, we had election in Singapore. So the same with mass holiday like Songkran in Thailand or Ari Raya in Indonesia. So we see that there is this inconsistency, mainly because of political or economic reasons that were considered more important than public health reason. And we had a lot of divide. So here uh, I show just up to now, uh, the rate of vaccination is very disequal with only Singapore having more and Brunei above 90% and Myanmar still only 50 and Timor-Leste, another poor country, 59%. So the containment measures were not uh, just, but even the health impact were not uh, just in a sense. The case fatality rate varies across country. Singapore has the lowest uh, 
uh, case fatality rates despite a high number of infections. So if you count the number of infections, the people that die because of that infections are relatively small compared to other countries. Indonesia has the highest mortality rate among health workers, which of course is a signal that something is wrong with the health system. We still cannot do the analysis that has been done in the United States, for instance, where you divide by race, socioeconomic group. We cannot do that because our data are not disaggregated and this will be one of our recommendation to start with. Migrants at the very high level of infection because of the living condition and because of the containment measure that were taken were infected and non-infected people were put together into the same dormitories, for instance, but they were also scapegoated for bringing the pandemic. So you have this uh, contradiction and again a paradox that those most infected are considered than the cause of the pandemic. And we have different degree of access to health system. Now, this is just to show uh, maternal wards during the pandemic in the Philippines. You can see the conditions, uh, how they were. Inequitable socioeconomic impacts. Not everyone got poorer. Many people got richer, actually. And that Oxfam has shown very well for the world, but we have data in the book about Thailand, Indonesia, and other countries. A lower wage worker, especially in the informal sector, were those who were hit the hardest. And this, the pandemic also showed that we have a very large portion of so-called working poor. So poor who work, but the salary is too low that they are still below the poverty line. So that is a very, so they have no saving, of course. And when the crisis arrive, then they have no resources to cope with that. And we continue with this, uh, uh, socioeconomic impacts, marginalization, enhanced vulnerability. Migrants, refugee, elderly people, people with disability, LGBTQI, etc. These were again subpopulation that were hit by the pandemic. And it's very interesting because they were in those conditions because many of them work in the informal sector. And why they work in the informal sector? Because they are discriminated in the formal sector. So you can see how discrimination work and put them in position of vulnerability. For employed population, age and gender make a difference and you can see in the graphic here. Now, gender has been talked a lot about the gender inequitable impacts. Women lost their job more quickly than men. Women, especially young women, are overrepresented in the sector most affected by the pandemic and in the informal world. And even worse, a lot of jobs that women fulfill are not considered jobs like domestic work or sex work or other kind of work like that. So no protection for them. A woman employment is shaped by care responsibility. So they had to leave their job to take care of the children. We know the children had to learn at home. No measure was done, no compensation for the women who had to leave their job to take care of the children, no division of task between husband and wife in the household. The pandemic actually highlighted. So the pandemic is not the causes. I want to stress it here. Uh, domestic violence doesn't happen because of the pandemic. The, the domestic violence happened because of gender inequity and patriarchal value. But the pandemic shows that patriarchal value are still very much there. So a lot of people was uh, beaten up, a lot of women, and they had no services to run to because everything was closed. And what about social protection? And this is, of course, the core of the chapter. Well, unfortunately, 
it was a very interesting because in one side you have very large investment. So uh, this is a sector that government don't pay too much attention. If you see the percentage of uh, GDP that goes to health and social protection for this region remains still quite low. So this, the investment that were made for uh, COVID were unprecedented. Yeah, they were enormous by the standard, but the standard is low. So let's, let's remember the standard is low, but compared to that standard, it was very large. And, but the investment were mainly in the first year, while the worst of the pandemic was in the second year. So it was inadequate to the needs. Here you see Thailand, how many people show up to get some money and the government had undervalued the number of needy. And then it was for a very short period of uh, time, on average, no more than three months uh, in all over the region. So you can imagine it was not enough for two years and more, because even now the impacts are felt. The cash allowance were the privileged modus, and this is also because there is an all a tension between welfare and many government not wanting to give welfare, but wanting to recovery as soon as possible. So how you recover? Stimulating consumer spending. And I think the case of Thailand shows uh, very well. Uh, so you give cash, so people buy, in the case of Thailand, you have too much the money and then you buy in certain shops, so the shop do better, consumers spend, the economy will recover. That was the thought. Uh, so you mix welfare, social protection objective with economic objective, and that is not always for the good of social protection. Uh, social care was lacking, so social care is a very important component of social protection, but we have not seen much of that. And employment support was also very uh, limited, while uh, of course would have been very crucial to the people who lost the job. Health insurance, again, was not universal, and in many cases people had to pay also for COVID treatment. We see that there are entrenched bias in this system. Civil servants are the favorite group. They get a good deal out of that. So the one where civil center did quite well, formal worker second place. But what about all the informal worker who are not a ban and the majority of the worker in our region? Uh, no universal approach was uh, uh, tempted even, except maybe in Singapore, but we will hear that there were problems also uh, there. There were exclusion also in Singapore. The social protection bypassed informal worker and people without bank or who were not dig digitally uh, competent. Elderly people, for instance, or people with disability who couldn't use all these apps. Informal workers were least likely to have access to social protection, resulting in hardship, rising poverty, food insecurity, asset depletion, and debts. A lot of households have become, uh, they were already in debts, now they are even more in debts. And this is a consequence that will be for many years. Most elderly are without pension and saving. This imply, uh, because the informal sector is the most impacted, that women marginalized group were not well or not covered since they concentrate in the informal sector. Workers, like I say, domestic worker, home workers, sex worker, which is a large part of women uh, worker population, were not considered at all because they are outside the labor market. Migrants and non-national were simply excluded from the thinking. No special arrangement for people with disability. So they got the same social protection like others without thinking that for people with disability, they have extra needs, particularly because they couldn't do their daily activity like usually. They couldn't have the caretakers as usually they would have. 
Social protection, this is also a very important uh, point, not talk much in the literature. Social protection is tied to ID and to residence, which imply that everyone who is undocumented cannot access the social protection. This is not only foreign migrants, it's domestic migrants in Vietnam, for instance, is also undocumented citizen. This photograph is transgender person uh, from Indonesia, but the same was in Malaysia, who don't have proper, proper identification ID, and therefore they couldn't access. And here in Thailand, ill tribes or other people or uh, children without citizenship, all these are uncovered by the social protection system. So to conclude, who cares? Now this, the work highlights the paradox, and this is the paradox of the title, that those people uh, who were most socially deprived, who were most and disproportionately affected by the crisis, yet they are also the one who are least social protected. So the one who most need actually were those who didn't get the protection that they deserve. So at the as the title asks, who cares about addressing what is a quite a significant injustice in the way we organize social protection system. So while individual and household have shown great resilience in coping mechanism, and I cannot go into detail on this, but we can discuss later, and civil society has played an essential role, but government often didn't like. So for instance, in the Philippines, people who provide support with red target as communists, which expose them uh, to critical view of the government. You can go in jail or worse. In Thailand too, uh, people providing support were not always uh, liked because they show that the government have failed in some way. So all this uh, was very important, but it's not sufficient for a sustainable approach. We need to have sustainable, uh, this is an example of uh, people uh, queuing for aid. So what we should do? The system of labor market and social protection must be radically revised. As I say, it's not enough to think about just technocratic twinkling here and there. We need to rethink the social protection system within a broader approach, which aim to reduce inequities, address issue of informality. We need to recognize that the majority of workers are informal, but they still need protection. So this is a change of thinking. And we also need for the labor market. And we need to expand civic space because those who advocate for this group were in civil society, which unfortunately in this region is not always tolerated. Reform should consider increase of wage. Every time there is discussion of minimum income, always we hear we don't have the resources. But it is extremely important because, as I say, there are a lot of working poor among us, so the salary is not enough. And we should start to think about universal social protection floor or minimum income, which for now is very far into the future, but doesn't mean we don't start a discussion about that. So reforms, if serious, could lead to a better normal for the many poor and near poor in Southeast Asia, but there needs to be political will not to use social protection in an ad hoc manner, like the case of Indonesia, when they increase the price of petrol, then we give a little bit more social allowances to the people, or like the Thai election, where we discuss as an election promise, the allowances. So in other words, we really need to put our effort together to think strategically and structurally for a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lear. And 
I think we heard a lot of, of uh, very insightful findings and also not just the problems, but also suggestions. But we will not go into the discussion now because we have two country studies that will be presented. I would like to maybe go straight to our uh, story from Singapore. We have uh, Dr. Stephanie Shok, who's a independent researcher and who was one of the key contributor of this uh, chapter. Um, yeah, okay. Um, Sawadika. Um, thank you, C Junction and um, Rosalia, um, for inviting me and my co author to be a part of this project. And thank you, everyone, for uh, spending your Friday evening here with us. Um, this project is very important because I feel like we are always urged to go back to normal. But for many people, COVID-19 has decimated their lives and their livelihoods. Um, as Rosalia has already pointed out, you know, um, it exposed the inequities that made certain communities so much more vulnerable. And as much as we are urged to go back to normal, perhaps there are some things that we should reject about the way things were. Yeah. So um, I'm just going to briefly start with some numbers. So these are March 2023 numbers in Singapore. But when we were immersed in our chapters and our research, we had numbers only up to December 2021. So if you look at the numbers then and now, um, that is really because of Omicron. So Omicron made the numbers jump exponentially in terms of COVID infections and also death rates. In terms of the economy, um, it was impacted in 2020 for Singapore, but then um, it recovered um, by the following year. But generally, the themes and patterns that were identified, that doesn't change. Generally, Singapore's vaccination rates continue to be among the highest in the world. Uh, fatality rate um, is among the lowest. Yeah. So I'm going to bring you back to 2021. In April 2021, Singapore uh, was named the best place in the world to be during COVID by Bloomberg. This was after they examined 53 major economies and they looked at things like case numbers, fatalities, vaccine stats and freedom of movement. But as a researcher, I guess when we read this, we thought um, best place for whom, right? So it was for the super rich, Singapore was a very attractive haven at that time. But for marginalized groups like migrant workers, sex workers, hawkers who relied on their daily takings, the low income who were engaged in service sector work, their livelihoods were completely disrupted, compensation was inadequate, life was chaotic and extremely stressful. And interestingly, in October 2021, Singapore dropped from number one to number 39, primarily because the curbs on travel uh, were not as liberal as that in Europe and the US. And this drop actually illustrates the volatility of the pandemic generally, but also it raises the problem of using mobility and border restrictions as a measure of resilience. So we looked at other kinds of indicators. If we use a rights-based approach, then a more complex picture emerges about how we should think about con how countries should actually be ranked in how they deal with COVID. So for our chapter, we use a social justice framework. We assess um, the country on how it provides for the vulnerable through social protection measures. And as um, Rosalia has already said, you know what we're trying to build is an inclusive, comprehensive and transformative social protection system. And I'm rushing because I've been told I have 10 minutes and I keep trying to delete slides, but Rosalia keeps telling me to put them back. So <laughs> uh, that's why I'm rushing a little bit, but there's time during Q&A to, to speak more. So the chapter in the chapter, we cover a few marginalized communities, uh, low-income families, migrant workers, sex workers, persons with disabilities. But for the purposes of today's presentation, I'm only going to focus on the local working poor and migrant workers. So these are just some of the headlines um, during the pandemic period. So inequality is stuck in many cities, but the pandemic really exposed and deepened these inequalities. So the ultra-rich really um, flocked to Singapore because of trust in the healthcare system. And it was very visible, you know, uh, for a period, uh, real estate prices were jumping, luxury cars um, were 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 soaring and the number of family officers which were set up to look after the assets of the rich there were just eight in 2017 
this year there are 700 family offices alone, right? But then in stark contrast, there were reports of sharp drops of income. So this is a study that I was involved in. Um, we analyzed the household income data of about 1,200 low-income families in Singapore who were living in what would be known as social housing in other countries. And we found that during the lockdown period, before and post-lockdown, the income drops were about 70%. Um, the household incomes were already very low in relative terms. So if you look at the household income, it was maybe $1,600. In Singapore, that's a very low household income. And it dropped to about $500 um, after the lockdown. And this was um, also reinforced by other research. So for example, DBS Bank, um, they also did a study and they found that um, for the lower income workers, their income dropped by more than 50%. So essentially, the less you had, the steeper were your income drops. So in terms of employment, um, for many, so we had the circuit breaker, or what was a lockdown uh, during this period, and a lot of wage earners lost money because they were retrenched, because business closed, they had wage cuts, there was reduction in the hours and overtime. So for a lot of low-income um, workers, because the hourly wages were so low, they relied a lot on overtime hours. We spoke to a lot of workers who were engaged in what ILO would term non-standard forms of work. So they had no health benefits, um, no sick leave. So during COVID, there were a lot of other restrictions. If you had COVID symptoms, you had to be on MC for five days. If you don't have um, sick leave, then you don't get paid for five days. So essential workers also faced increased risk of exposure to COVID, but their wages did not reflect this risk. You know, so low wage workers often face difficult choices, right, between income and health. And this also made public health risk containment more challenging. So there were a number of cases of low income workers who were actually jailed for going to work against COVID-19 regulations. So there's a homeless man who worked even though he was on stay home notice, he was sentenced to seven weeks of jail. And another man who didn't want to lose his work incentive because his income was so low, he did not want to take sick leave and he also was sent to jail. So this criminalizing of persons who breach COVID-19 regulations to work, this really obscures the fact that there's a lack of employment protections that compel persons to risk their health and risk a jail term in order to earn income that they really need to support their families. So, okay, so Singapore um, had an unprecedented budget. They had so many packages. They had stimulus measures of almost 100 billion in the first half of 2020 and again in uh, 2011 they supplemented this by another 11 million and this table is in the book so i'm not going to read out everything yeah so according to the ministry of finance this helped to dampen the shock to the gdp um it saved or created uh hundreds 155 000 jobs and reduced the unemployment rate but some of the Criticisms were that the emergency measures were too narrowly focused and time limited, and they tended to be geared towards protecting businesses rather than individual families. The actual amounts received by households relative to the economic impacts that were felt were modest. So Singaporean households received approximately $2,000, despite the huge amount just now. And the welfare applicants um, surfaced that there were a range of issues trying to access aid. So it was inadequate. There was excessive paperwork that were adversarial, humiliating encounters with welfare officers. And there was a lot of opaqueness in decision-making processes about who could or could not access certain types of aid. So I wanted to uh, show you this chart because I think within Southeast Asia, sometimes certain amounts may seem large, but in the Singapore context, if you look at the median household income from work um, and the bottom 10%, you can see that inequality is quite great. Also, we do not have a poverty line. There's no national poverty line in Singapore. The government has refused to set a poverty line. So who is actually considered poor, right? So this is a sort of erasure of the working poor, but researchers have tried. Right, so if you want to use um, the benchmark for relative poverty, then you can use the 50% of national medium. And in 2021, uh, a team of researchers, I was part of the team as well, we tried to use the minim minimum income standards methodology and we 
<clears throat> tried to come up with a starting point for a living wage and it's 2,906. Sorry, am I blocking you? So, so if you look at that, and these are the welfare benchmarks and it's not transparent. You're, we are not told why and how they came up with this benchmark and it's not been revised for a very long time. So the discrepancy between what researchers um, say should be a starting living wage and what is actually given out um, the disparity is quite great. So the budget is unprecedented, but there's no substantive scrutiny of the welfare regime or Singapore's labour rights framework. Wages are very low and stagnated in Singapore for a large number of workers, especially those in the service sector. If the recommended living wage is 2009, a cleaner in Singapore may get maybe 1,005. Yeah? Labour force statistics do not include temporary migrant workers, of which we have about a million, and their wages could be much lower. So if you look at that sheet here, a migrant worker could be paid as little as $290 a month in basic wages in Singapore. So we have no mandated minimum wage. We do not have an unemployment insurance scheme. And the poverty rate among the elderly working poor has been increasing. So I'm going to move on to migrant workers now. So Singapore is a popular country of destination within the region. There are close to 1 million temporary migrant workers engaged in low-wage work. Hi, program. From construction to marine shipping, and there are about 200,000 uh, live-in domestic workers. So there was a spike in COVID-19 infections among the migrant worker dormitories in April 2020. That so a lot side of Thai. Sorry, is it me? Yeah. Understanding of the world by language. Um, yeah, so there was a spike in COVID-19 infections. So a large number of male migrant workers, about 300 over 1,000 of them in the construction and shipping industries, they live in large purpose-built dormitories in Singapore. This is like a special living arrangement for them, and they tend to be overcrowded. NGOs warned that this would lead to an outbreak, but nothing was done. The outbreak happened, and then there was a lockdown. And the men were under lockdown for 18 months. While the rest of the country opened up, even after the lockdown, for migrant workers as a distinct community, their lockdown continued. So this had severe impacts on their mental health. There was a spike in distress calls. There were reports of suicide, but not in the mainstream media. And even public health officials, I mean, public health experts, not officials, public health experts towards the end were saying you, you should not have the lockdown anymore. There's no reason because most of them were vaccinated. Most of them had caught COVID. By September 2021, migrant workers made up 74% of all recorded COVID-19 cases in the country. So I just wanted to highlight one particular incident. So in October last year, there were a group of Chinese migrant workers who were hired by a huge shipping company and they took to social media to complain about their conditions in the dormitory. So they said that there was poor quality catered food. You can see there were worms and newspapers in their food. Um, men were sleeping on the floor outside because they were not properly isolated, even though they had COVID. So they took to social media and complained about um, the conditions that they were exposed to. So they said things like, it feels like our dignity is being trampled on. The dormitory management does not care about those who are sick. We've been sick for seven or eight days. Our fever is high and we have to make noise before anything is done. So how did the government respond? They sent a riot squad, right? And um, so in the newspaper, you would see pictures of like poor conditions and then riot squad. So when they were asked about this in parliament, the minister said, oh, the workers were behaving aggressively and there was um, potential for violence. The minister also said that these newly arrived workers are used to a very different COVID-19 management strategy. So this is a very typical um, response to, to migrant workers trying to collectively organize, right? So they will be 
if you if you want to complain, you have to go through proper channels. If you try to organize, then you are a troublemaker and you will become you will be treated as a security concern. And systemic issues are not acknowledged, right? If you if you complain about food, they will treat it as an exceptional situation. We will deal with it case by case. Okay, so this is, so in March this year, the government, sorry, no, I wasn't looking at the timekeeper. This is my second last slide. Okay, so in March this year, um, the government did a white paper where they tried to review their own COVID-19 experiences and basically their lesson when it came to migrant worker dormitories was, oops, simply that they should have done more surveillance and had more data. That was the lesson that they learned from what happened um, in, over the last two years. So in conclusion, Singapore should be treated as a cautionary tale. Yes, there's been remarkable economic growth. It's very efficient, low death rates, but we need to understand also the political reality, right? In Singapore, you have a citizenry that's very accustomed to rule abidance. We are very highly tolerant of paternalistic approaches. We relied a lot on legislation, you know, all the people who were jailed. So we had to rely on legislation to uh, moderate behavior. The economic success is tainted by deepening inequality. The conditionality remains a key pillar of the welfare regime. Financial aid is still couched as the last resort. Um, as Rosalie has already said, these structural inadequacies were not addressed then and they are still not sufficiently addressed now. And when we evaluate a country's pandemic performance, we need to look beyond narrow economic metrics. We need to consider how the government protects the rights of the vulnerable. Um, as one writer noted, there are those who will want to return to normal after this crisis and there are those who will decide that what was regarded as normal before was itself the crisis. And I think that that's what we should think about when we think, when we consider how we want to deal with a pandemic in the future. And we, when we want to look at countries that are held up as models, you know, we need to just look beyond just the economic metrics. That's it. Yeah. So um, that's the end of my presentation. And I want to give a shout out to Grace who took um, all the photos in the book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Very interesting story from Singapore. Even with resource, there are still issues that need still need to be dealing with. Uh, we will move next to another country not far away. It's here in Thailand. So uh, we have uh, here uh, Dr. Rapi Panjong Marung from uh, Department of Community Health, Faculty of Public Health, Haidon University, who will share uh, what his team has found in terms of the situation and the response in Thailand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kap. So before I can find my slides, just to I would like to just to acknowledge my uh, my colleague, uh, Associate Professor Tira Nong, you know, Kunsi at the back, the first author of this chapter, and also from the Institute of Population and Social Research, and also of course there are my co another colleague, Dr. Lasaria, from also the Institute for Population and Social Research as well. And um, okay, so uh, before uh, before we can get to the slides, the oh, well, the inspirations that we started this chapter because the first of all, first of all, we could see that the that's the uh, that's the uh, large um, incidence of disparities in the Thai social welfare system. So we we believe that the uh, during the COVID-19 there must be some problems or uh, or we believe that the our existing the uh, social protection policies may not be accommodating effectively to those who are affected. Now now I feel like <laughs> there's so many people <laughs> surrounding me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. This one. This one. <laughs> okay. Now now we're back. So when you have to rely on the technology, sometimes it's not reliable if it doesn't like you much. 
Anyway, okay, this is to uh, to, uh, to acknowledge my co uh, my colleagues here, and then the um, in terms of the uh, continue with the inspiration. Well, we questions about the uh, government's policy in response to the COVID nineteen uh, 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 during the COVID nineteen epidemic about how government copes with the situation. But uh, but let's say that the my first author, Dr. Rienon, is some kind of you know when you do something wrong, she just you know slap on the wrist kind of person. But for me, I'm kind of the uh, open the uh, battlefield with a person. So. Sometimes the, at three o'clock in the morning, we have to call to each other and yell to at each other. Why? Because the, we are concerned that the, if we uh, put to, uh, if we criticize the uh, too much strong, uh, too much uh, of the uh, current government policies, sometimes we might get what do you call the um, of uh, our government Spencer the uh, holidays uh, in the confined military uh, uh, complex um, for six months maybe. So, but anyway, for the uh, after the new election, so we feel more relaxed and more bold to be more outside speaking so let's see let's see let's uh, let, let's see well uh, and also we love to hear about the uh, uh, about the actual what actually uh, what actually has happened with the different uh, groups of people so that's why we interview people as well but just to give you a little bit background who doesn't know well about the Thailand social protection policy um, uh, in general there are three majors the uh, social protection uh, protection policies in Thailand the first one is the uh, civil servant medical uh, benefit scheme this uh, covers 7% of the entire population. So I like that, uh, like Dr. Rostle mentioned that, that this is the most fancy one because uh, you work from the government and you have to be the government civil servant. But now the new system is that you can also be the government employees, which is not part of this uh, social protection scheme. So only the uh, older generation. So for this one, imagine imagine that you have, are covered with all medical expenses and also your families are also covered. The second type is called the social security scheme, which is account to 16% of the entire population. These people are working in the private sector, including the uh, government employees like myself and Dr. Trianong, that we all have the same benefit as in the uh, Government, uh, government, uh, as the uh, pr people working in the private sector. But the majority of people are not actually covered within these uh, the first two. They are only covered by the what we call the National Health Security uh, uh, Scheme, which only covered uh, for the medical expenses. So basically, if you lost your job or anything happened to you economically, you're not covered except, uh, unless you are sick. Send and then you get fee medical uh, benefits. But if you lost your jobs or if you don't have the, uh, like, let's say, if you are living on the daily wages, uh, if you uh, don't have any jobs on that day, there is no social protection at all. Okay, so. Um, I'm not going, going to uh, I'm not going to details about the methodologies, but just go through to the some findings and observations. Um, I I told I told Dr. Rasulila that the uh, we probably uh, wouldn't want to reveal all the key points. It's like you know when you are about to be naked. When you have naked, it's more interesting when you see the whole naked thing, right? So we we are, we just would like to only highlight some uh, some parts of the of the uh, chapter so that you can continue to read the chapters. Sorry about about that that the. Um, uh, uh, that remarks. Anyway, just to make it clear. So the first thing that we found, uh, we found that there is some, uh, some imbalance between the public health measures and also reducing the uh, re uh, reducing economic uh, repercussion. So one one part of one group of people want to actually stay. What do you call to make their country more uh, quarantined as long as possible so that we can control the disease. But there's another group of people who are starving. Because of the quarantine, and then you cannot, uh, and then you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, earn for the living. So you want to uh, ease at least the uh, the quarantine so that you can be more flexible in terms of uh, moving around. And there are, uh, and I'm going to speak more about this in the later uh, in the later slides. And uh, the uh, the second thing that we found is that the we I think the whole country has underestimated the needs of the people. And we could see a lot more uh, uh, in uh, in the chapter as well. And we could see that. Uh, there is insufficient and limited quarter or subsidies. In Thailand, it's very strange when we talk about the social welfare. It's supposed to be everyone, right? But in Thailand, uh, the quarter is limited. So there's limited the uh, what they call uh, availabilities of the uh, social welfare. So you have to compete in order to get uh, to get the benefits. Um, I'm not sure whether where else in the world that you have what we call the competing social welfare, but but you can find it in Thailand. And also, so so that's why we uh, that's why one of the uh, key informants they call it the welfare that you have to fight over to get, and this is very unique. 
and uh, for the money subs uh, subsidies are good, but only for a short term. I think that you have heard some of the uh, 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 Thai government's program, like 5,000 baht, 7,000 baht. But then again, when the money comes in your hand, only in a short time, the money is gone. And then what's next? Because the, uh, we have been living in a COVID situation for uh, at least uh, two or three years. And then 5,000 baht, how much it, could it cover? 5,000, maybe less than 120 US dollars for two years. Could you live with uh, that amount of money? Not exactly, not, not really. And there are uh, many things that uh, uh, is not included in a subsidiary program. For example, we have to pay for the debts, uh, for the rent, and then the uh, government gives you the what do you call the e, uh, uh, electronic money that could be used for certain, certain things. Uh, and then the, uh, you, you cannot pay uh, back your debts and then they can, sometimes you cannot go to the uh, local grocery stores because they're not registered in the system. There are a lot of problems ongoing. And also the question is that, uh, the, the, the uh, last question is that, did we really reach to the bottom of the, uh, of the people at the, uh, you know, that the lowest or the bottom of the socioeconomic sector of the society? Because the, uh, in the, in the, um, in the subs uh, subsidiary program, people at least uh, need to be a little bit co uh, computer literate. So they have to need to have the smartphone because the other programs, you have to register online. So how come people at the, uh, with the, uh, what they call minimum wage can afford a smartphone with the internet package? You know, at least you have to need the, uh, some unlimited package in order to access to the services. And, uh, and more of that, you have to compete in order to get the limited quarter of the uh, money that uh, the government is, the, uh, is allocating. So if you have the uh, very the, uh, cheap smartphone with limited internet package, and then you are not so fast of the uh, as the speed is not so fast. How could you compete in order to register in time? Because from the news, sometimes only ten at the first ten minutes, it, the uh, the quarter is already full. So in terms of the uh, uh, so we could see that there is the technological innovation that can expand the coverage. It means that it can reach a larger number of people. True, but also it highlights the disparity because the uh, for uh, for example from the government assistance program do not actually benefit the poor like I just mentioned before, but there are more more cases we interview people with disability, and then there is the one function uh, there is one program that required eye scanning. I interview one uh, a person uh, a blind person, and she said that well the government has that eye scanning program, where can I get an eye? I don't have eyes, so I could. Um, I was not eligible for the program, and for that, for that reason, for that reason, what happened is that she has to ask for her relatives or people surrounding her to help her with the registration. But she said that that's only like a one out of ten people that have that kind of luxury, meaning that the, there are some people assisting them. But the rest of the nine out of ten, they have to hire somebody. And it means that, for example, I have to have the uh, Stephanie uh, uh, to to help me. She might say that, okay, if you get uh, if the uh, you're gonna get hundred baht, she might ask for the um, let's say commission for twenty percent. So I'm on my only get eighty percent, and that's uh, what's commonly happen among the people with disabilities. So basically, people at the what do you call at the bottom of the food chain does uh, do not get the full benefits. This is only one of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the cases, but there are many other cases like this. And the uh, short leave improvement. Uh, the measures in the first year, as you have seen, there's, there's so many uh, programs, uh, which are in the chapter, we have uh, outlined the whole government programs, everything, but is mostly concentrating in the, uh, uh, in the first year. Imagine that the, uh, this is good in terms of the uh, government's, the, uh, what do you call, uh, performance, because when you boost up the money into the system, you can manipulate the GDP so to show the result of the government that, hey, the GDP does not go down. But you put, when you put the money into the system, only the maybe middle class people that have that kind of access and then they spend the money. So you can, you know, trick people around the world saying that oh, Thailand is doing um, okay because the GDP does not go down. But the question is that the money does not reach out to those who are actually in need. 
and also the long containment measures uh, doesn't doesn't help. The uh, the only thing that uh, make pe uh, that made people survive is from the uh, uh, often the people themselves or the philanthropists because they have some kind of you know uh, uh, people initiated program and uh, providing food, providing money, providing the essentials uh, to the others. And this is the things that uh, can make the people last for the past two years. What happened because the uh, for the government it was only good for the, at the beginning. For example, there are so many people that who are uh, who are facing the total exclusion in terms of the healthcare and social welfare. Like for example, sex workers. Okay, and there's sex workers. They um, uh, I answer, I interview an NGO saying that in Pattaya City, when you have to quarantine, you close all the businesses. What did the government? Uh, what did the government do? What they did is that the ministry. I wouldn't name the uh, the name of the ministry, but one ministry who's supposed to help with all the uh, all the uh, essentials. They brought 20 packs of the subsistence package to Pattaya City in order to help sex workers. So we uh, they ask questions like, are you assuming that there are only 20 sex workers living in Pattaya City? Well, there are tens of thousands of them. But of course, the, uh, in Thailand, legally, there are no sex workers, but you can find them when you go to the streets. See, so this is the first one, and uh, and we have found that there are increasing number of the middle aged the uh, sex uh, sex workers in the system as well, and migrant workers. Uh, you have seen the picture when they have you know, no jobs, no payment, and they are living in confined environment. You know the zinc uh, zinc wall, and then there are a lot of people uh, support that. Hey, they should quarantine more, a longer time. Imagine that living in the kind of box, you know, with air, with no air condition. It's worse. Okay. So and my last point, like last point. So basically, when we talked about the uh, in the chapter, we talk about the uh, social protection policy. We only talk so much about the equality, but actually we should talk more about equity. So reaching those who we're supposed to reach better, more attention to the informal sector, and also there must be the uh, both short term and long term protection, and also the uh, social protection or financial protection should be more uh, has become more essential than ever. It means that we need to to be uh, to be more articulated in terms of the uh, developing such policies, and we also our program should be uh, re revisited. Well, we could see the uh, good things coming out of the uh, winning parties, but they only talk about the uh, talk about the. Uh, 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 re uh, re uh, re uh, revisiting the policies, but actually we haven't seen much about talking about the uh, uh, structural reforms. So you can find more details uh, in the uh, in the th chapter for Thailand, chapter number four. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rapipan. We wish we have an hour for him, no, so to hear more stories. Very interesting about what happened in Thailand. Uh, we have heard two countries and overview of the region. In the book, there are more, but this is just to tease your interest in case you want to read a full book, like what you suggested. Uh, uh, we will go straight next to uh, Mr. Benjamin Harkins, who is a technical expert at the LO Regional Office for Asia and Pacific, and he has done a lot of work in relation to both uh, social protection, migrant workers, and others. And he will share with us some initial thoughts uh, that he has about this work. And we, after that, we'll open the floor to you. Thank you. OK. Thanks, Kun Pia. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Leah and, and C Junction for inviting me to be a part of today's uh, panel discussion. Uh, I'm really honored to join the event and, and add my two cents to the discussion of this seminal new book on COVID-19. Um, it is an extremely thorough review, and it covers social protection response in to COVID-19 in six countries as well as regionally. But since I don't think I can cover a 350-page book in 10 minutes, I'm just going to pick out a few key uh, highlights today. So starting with, with Leah's chapter on the regional situation, the analysis really uses COVID-19 not only to highlight the unequal support that was provided during the pandemic, but it also uses it as a tool to bring up broader issues with inequality in Southeast Asia. It's really a very fundamental critique of the way that societies are currently organized 
under the emerging neoliberal he hegemony in the region. And I read it as a call to action, not just for reforms of social protection systems, but indeed a much more transformational agenda. The chapter particularly explores what Leah refers to as the paradox of social protection in Southeast Asia. And that is to say the situation where the greatest share of public expenditure doesn't actually benefit the most disadvantaged in society, but rather it largely, largely reinforces the existing inequalities. It acknowledges that indeed COVID-19 exacerbated some of those challenges, but it also makes clear the point that the blatant differences in support for marginalized groups are really a structural feature in Southeast Asia, and they're not the result of this one exceptional event. As an ILO representative, I really appreciate the heavy emphasis on the informal sector uh, within Leah's chapter, as well as several others. I was actually based in Myanmar during most of the COVID-19 pandemic, and I repeatedly encountered a massive blind spot among donors and policy makers in respect to informal sector workers. They just could not seem to grasp that major investments in expanding government social security benefits during the pandemic were still going to leave 90% of the labor force behind. It simply did nothing for the domestic workers, the fishers, the street vendors, the rickshaw drivers, and the sex workers who never had access to any of those benefits in the first place. Another important point made in the book is that any movement towards establishing more universal coverage by social protection in Southeast Asia really needs to focus on the groups that are currently neglected, and particularly that includes workers in the informal sector. There's long been a narrative in the region which defines eligibility for social protection in terms of deservedness rather than universality. But the reality is, uh, sorry, workers have to prove their worth in society in order to earn the benefits uh, of social protection schemes. But the reality we know is that the types of work that are judged to be undeserving are overwhelmingly be, being done by women, by migrants, by ethnic minorities, and by other marginalized groups within the region. It's work that is simply undervalued, not undeserving of equal support. As I am a labor migration specialist by trade, I also wanted to talk briefly about the Thailand chapter and its analysis of the treatment of migrant workers during uh, COVID-19. I've been working on these issues in Thailand for quite a long time, but even I was quite unprepared for the sheer, sheer xenophobia of some of the policy responses adopted towards migrants during COVID-19. The Thailand chapter that Kun Rapipan uh, and others um, wrote really talks about, in particular, the bubble and seal policy which was instituted across several key economic sectors in Thailand. And what he notes is that essentially that was walling migrants off from the rest of Thai society, in some cases with actual barbed wire fences. Uh, sorry. Um, whatever happened inside the parameters of that containment was largely immaterial as long as the possibility of virus transmission was reduced outside the scope of it. As noted in, in the chapter, there was widespread infection, there was a lack of food, there was inadequate hygiene, and limited access to healthcare services for people inside those bubbles. And through all of this, what we were told is that this is actually a good practice that had been adopted from other countries within the region. It was referred to as, quote unquote, the Singapore model by the Thai authorities in some cases. I would go so far as to say that the pandemic really made visible the latent nationalism in Thailand in a way that we have seldom seen before. 
I think it's long been an unspoken part of labor migration policy in Thailand that migrants from neighboring countries are allowed to come here as workers, but they're not allowed to come here fully as human beings. The willingness to simply lock migrants away from the rest of the Thai population, even when there was no clear evidence that they were the source of infection clusters, was cl quite revealing in that respect. It was really a policy based on the perceived disposability of migrant workers, not public health data. What the chapter also brings up is that this broader neglect of the welfare of migrants is clearly reflected in the lack of social protection provided to them. Again, it brings us back to this concept of who is really deserving of coverage. Benefits are not being distributed to ensure that those who are most in need actually receive them. And instead, eligibility is determined by nationality, by immigration status, and the economic importance ascribed to their work. As the chapter notes, a fundamental shift in understanding of social protection as being a fundamental human right is really needed to ensure that coverage is extended to migrants and their family members. Until migrants and other marginalized groups in Thailand are included uh, in the Thailand's definition of universality, social protection will really, really remain a privilege of the few rather than an entitlement for all. I'd also like to briefly talk about the chapter on Singapore in the book. Stephanie's piece notes a trend that we saw throughout the region during COVID-19, which was really heavy reliance on authoritarian directives handed down by governments with a lot, without a lot of consultation of the broader population. With its one party system, there's no doubt that Singapore was successful in many ways in managing the pandemic. The chapter notes that a citizenry that is already highly accustomed to strict um, government regulations and paternalism was really well prepared for the lockdown policies, the mandates and directives that were issued during COVID-19. However, it also allowed for egregious human rights violations to go unchallenged, such as the restriction of over 300,000 migrant workers in dormitories for over two years. The chapter really asks important questions that must be answered about whether authoritarian governance is acceptable if it leads to economic growth in Southeast Asia, but not fair, inclusive, and pluralistic societies. Finally, the book has a strong emphasis in highlighting the role of civil society and community-based efforts in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think anyone who is here in Southeast Asia during that time probably recognizes there was really a massive mobilization of communal, philanthropic, and grassroots responses that was absolutely necessary to fill some of the gaps in government initiatives. The irony here, of course, is that many governments in the region have been doing their utmost to cripple the vitality of civil society groups in recent years because they view them as a threat to their authority. As Leah concludes in her chapter, civil society space is really crucial for a transformative approach to social protection to take place. And these changes simply will not happen without the possibility for people to organize to, to demand greater social justice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben. I think we have had a very wonderful presentation and also a very thoughtful uh, comments from uh, our speakers. I would like to take this opportunity to, to open for questions and also any comments that you may have uh, to the speakers. Yeah. 
everybody hear me? Yes. Oh yeah, yes. thanks very much. Um, wonderful presentations and um, uh, uh, it, it makes me think about have we actually moved on from the 19th century when we're talking about the deserving and the undeserving? And we're still talking about it. We talked it about, about it with cholera. We talked about it with sexually transmitted diseases in the 1870s. We talked about it with HIV. We're always talking about the same thing. And it, it often seems to me that we're trying to separate the deserving from the undeserving. And I thought there was a very eloquent explanation of what, maybe why that is. And it's, it seems that we've almost ignored some of the fundamentals around transmission dynamics. The, the viruses nor the, 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 the viruses don't carry passports. We, we, we all know that. My, my question is really to, to all of you in regard to whether you've gained any insights into whether some of the coercive measures that you've highlighted um, not only changed behavior of individuals, but did they change the manner in which the epidemic unfolded, the pandemic unfolded? And do we have any insights because surveillance was impacted as a consequence? I was in Thailand throughout the period, and I remember getting a cough in the early part of the pandemic. And the last thing I was going to do was get tested for COVID. There was no chance if I was feeling just about OK, the last thing I was going to do, because it was going to what was going to happen was mandatory isolation at enormous cost. And I'm not alone in that. And I'm, you know, you know, I didn't need to work. But um, the same thing was said by the mayor barns in the condos that I that I met. There's an enormous reluctance to get tested. And the surveillance, I've still struggled to understand what was happening in the region because the surveillance was so problematic. So I wonder if anyone, anyone would like to comment on, on the, the nature of the coercive measures taken and the consequences on general public health. Thanks. We will take a couple of questions, and then we allow our speakers to... Yes. Yeah, that's the trick. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to make three points. Uh, number one is I would like to congratulate Leah and the whole team for this work, because what they have done is they've delivered evidence and hard facts for us uh, to confirm things we probably knew already, or we think we know, because any sort of disaster or emergency usually has implications, different implications to different groups of people. And usually the, the poor and the excluded are the ones who bear the brunt and are most affected. And that's clearly documented now with hard facts. So thank you very much for that. Uh, secondly, I would really be interested on the, uh, the, 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 the example you mentioned from Thailand on how people are competing for receiving social welfare benefits. So I'm, I have never heard about that. And as you rightly said, probably there's no other country where that is happening. So if you could explain that a little bit. Uh, and thirdly, I would like to uh, bring out a point which is probably outside of the scope of the study, but certainly connected. And that is the, the long-term macroeconomic implications of the social welfare programs which we see. And um, we see what governments have done probably two things in different mixtures. One, they have increased their debts. So they have asked for more money. So they have, have debts now, which they have to pay back. And secondly, they may have used the printing press to print more money, which has increased inflation in many of the countries. And both have also effects of dividing rich and poor further, because the debts come from people who have the money, who, who can lend it to the government. They will, in the future, in the future years, get more money from the government budgets into their pockets because they have interests to cash in and, and the return of, the, of this uh, uh, money they've lent. And on the other side, inflation is something which we know very well affects the poor much more than, than the rich because the prices, the prices for the basic need, food, food stuff, et cetera, increases drastically. So we will see implications of this crisis for the next years to come unless governments 
rethink, as you rightly say in the book, uh, the whole strategy about social protection. And unfortunately, I haven't seen any government which would have thought about how to reform their tax systems. How can they go into acquiring resources which they can distribute more equally? That's the point of the, the research. But that hasn't happened so far. And that's something I think we should think about and include in our thinking and the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have four questions out of two. Oh, one more. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, congratulations, Leah. I'm happy that finally this book uh, launched. And also, that's good presentation. Uh, I just want because I haven't read, so I, w I wonder maybe now we can, um, something that for me is really interesting about, uh, you know, the long-term impact and uh, in terms of many family, they lost the breadwinner. And then, uh, so they are uh, the family, even the parent, both parents. So this is about something that maybe something that's also included in the social protection for the long term. And also for the like depression, uh, because many uh, research regarding the increase of the violence, uh, domestic violence, but also for the uh, depression, especially for also for not only for, uh, you know, for young children uh, in terms of uh, because they have to stay at home and then no family, that, no uh, school, no friend, but also maybe for uh, adults. So this is something i interested, is it something is in their book? Thank you. Thank you very much. Another question linked to mental health and the challenge that posed from both the pandemic and the responses and how social protection or social responding to that. So three person. Okay, I will start from the surveillance. I think it's very interesting. Uh, for people like me and you probably who have gone through the HIV AIDS pandemic in Southeast Asia working here. A lot of lessons that were learned with HIV were not applied at all uh, during COVID, including the issue of fear, right? There was a lot about scaring people, which we know for HIV doesn't work. We have, there was a lot about this uh, forcing people to do things which, and then people got scared and they would not go to testing rather than making testing confidential and all this. Again, all kind of lesson that actually were learned. There was in HIV AIDS, there was an all uh, very clear uh, what worked was involvement of civil society. Now we have not seen that. Uh, there was also involvement of social scientists. We have not seen that to the same extent. So it has been a very medicalized, very security oriented approach. And that has had, in my view, negative consequences in terms of, ter uh, I mean, we know that there was very little testing in Southeast Asia, one part because people were scared to, that means that when they became uh, sick was already quite late and they died because of that. That has been one cause, is, it's not the only cause. I mean, government have not been very good in providing free testing, for instance, to people, but for like Indonesia, if you were found positive, then the government would pay for you. But if you were found negative, then the government would not pay for your testing. So that means people would not go. And many of those kind of measures that didn't encourage people to take preventive out of their own awareness rather than uh, what we say. And what we say, I think in the book is very clear. Those that were punished, were people of lower socioeconomic status. The other way, the other could do much more than. So what you say of surveillance and securitization also applied according to socioeconomic class. Now on the issue of migrants, clearly this uh, uh, bubble and seal was counterproductive because many people got infected. Of course, government counted on the fact that they were young and strong and therefore would not die eventually. But 
it was a risk. It has been a risk and some have died. So, I mean, uh, they were playing with people. So in that case, it's very clear security approach is not good for health. I mean, that is an extreme, but there are many other cases like that. And it's a pity again, uh, that the lesson of HIV AIDS, actually with Fabio, um, we have written an article on uh, social approach to HIV AIDS. And one of the points we made is exactly all this issue about fear and surveillance and all this, which we knew very well didn't work, were not applied in this. Yeah, okay, but that one was the one, it's not in this book, but this book also is in the same line of thought. Uh, then I think for uh, the point that uh, was saying about the tax system, you know, that is considered indeed the whole issue of resourcing uh, social protection system. Uh, that there are ways of doing it. So this uh, issue that always is said, we don't have enough money. Uh, we know that this is a question of priority. What is your priority as government? Where are you putting the money, right? I mean, are you putting in social protection? Are you putting in health? Are you putting military, uh, whatever, or are you putting? So it's a choice. And then, of course, through tax, etc. We know in most of the country of Southeast Asia, taxes are not uh, well organized, people don't pay, uh, there are a lot of leeway about paying taxes. So there is a lot that can be done in that area too, in terms of resourcing social uh, protection system. Plus, if it is a very efficient system, then of course you can eliminate a lot of waste. Of, uh, but again, what is the objective of this social uh, protection uh, system? Uh, for the last point of day, we I think on the issue of yes, we say very clearly the most serious impact of COVID has been the loss of life of people. That is the most, which often is not considered an economic impact. But it is, of course, human life, it is. So the government, they didn't think, oh, so many people have died. And that is very bad for our country, you know? So that is very interesting to see. And I think you are very right. The impacts will be for generation to come. And very interestingly, like she showed, Omicron actually was quite serious. The first months of 2022, in Thailand, in Vietnam, in Singapore, we are talking about large cases and a lot, lot of people died initially, but already by then government were in the phase, we have to open up, it's finished. We don't want to think about this. And even now, you know, uh, my staff as COVID is not here. The publisher could not come because two have COVID. And so that is economic cost also and also people getting sick and some of them do die. So it is still going on uh, what is happening. And yes, it is in the book. Yeah, maybe one add on, uh, one question remaining is on the competition for the social welfare in Thailand. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of the uh, competing social welfare, giving one program, um, Let's uh, let's say that the program has the uh, has the subsidy program for each individual for five thousand baht. But the government says that the person who registered online only the first two million people uh, that will be eligible for the uh, for the five thousand because the government has limited money. So basically, you need to have the uh, a very good smartphone, maybe a smartphone fast with the good internet coverage, right? If you have the like a 2000 baht smartphone with your know, limited package, you're not going to get it. And if you are and on top of that, if you are computer illiterate and if you are a little bit or, uh, older or younger or uh, cannot read much, then the uh, and how come and f according to the news in certain program, the quota was full within the first 10 minutes. My mother was eligible for certain programs. She woke me up at 5.50 in the morning in order to go online because the system opened at 6 in the morning. And by the time that it becomes 6, uh, 6 o'clock and 9 minutes, the quarter was full. And I couldn't do it. Even I couldn't do it 
because the quarter uh, was filled quickly. So that's what the, uh, was, uh, that's what we call the compete uh, com uh, competing the social welfare. But another another thing is that the uh, there's a point that you were talking about the uh, deserved and then undeserved the uh, uh, the benefits. Well, in Thailand, when we have the uh, what we call the uh, the given and the givers, right? When you know, uh, so uh, when you do give free food to others, and then they, they, in the news in Thailand, they said that the person who gave the news or uh, uh, give the food or the money to other people, they feel fulfilled. Um, I did something really good for the society, but I got angry instead because why they have to be the givers and the given so imagine that if you have to beg to eat beg to leave beg to have more money every time so how can you uh where was the uh how can we um what do you call ensure the equal dignity so a person was born equal and they should be entitled to the dignity nobody needs to uh, nobody needs to beg to leave uh, nobody uh, needs to beg to uh, eat but they should be uh, you should be entitled to have the equitable access to food and social welfare and a lot of government programs without baking and i think the point of this book is to start addressing that although we, we uh, although that uh, for the talent chapter we were not bold enough to challenge the uh, uh, structure uh, uh, about the structural reform but at least uh, we try to um, uh, to ignite some of the ideas that probably perhaps the status quo or the things that we have been doing, maybe it is not the right thing. There should be uh, something should be changed. Thank you, thank you so much. So uh, as uh, I think we heard that it exposed so many issues. Yes, Stephanie. I'll just address two points: one about surveillance and one about mental health. So in Singapore, there was like a mini uproar about surveillance because we all had to use a contact tracing app, the Trace Together app. And in Parliament, it was revealed that it, it could be used for criminal prosecutions. So that was very alarming. Um, but then in Singapore, it's, it's highly urbanized and it was virtually impossible to avoid because every building entrance would have a thermometer. You walk in, you get scanned. Some of them use like the eye scanning. So if you had to go to work every day, if you had to go to um, buildings, malls, you could not avoid um, the surveillance and as a as a citizen we just had to accept it yeah um, with mental health um, I think one of the positive things was that there was a lot done to reduce the stigma around the mental health that that um, collectively everybody was facing the problem we had was when um, when it came to migrant workers stuck in dormitories for like almost two years all the state um, the state had a disproportionate emphasis on rounding up charities to assist them in their mental health. So we'd be saying, stop locking them up, pay them their salaries, make sure they can transfer employers, and then they'll just get a helpline number, talk to someone, maybe you'll feel better. You know, So in that way, the overemphasis on mental health when we were talking about systemic issues actually obscured the fact that we really you have the power to do something to overturn the policies but then they just keep saying it's in your mind you just need to be more resilient and deal with it yeah thank you stephanie when you like to add some points uh, more questions if we have one here and one here yes Three. Okay, Leia first. Hello. Hi, I, I would like to pose a political question. Uh, this is uh, when a person contacts with COVID, uh, he gets uh, after, you know, after the effect of COVID, he gets this uh, zombification feeling. And this zombification feeling is something like you cannot rest. You cannot work. You're basically zombified. And I don't say this uh, as what happened to me, but as an archetype. Long COVID, yeah. yeah, long COVID, yes. So this is not what happened to me. This happened to archetype of the society. So these people will think politics in the future, and they will have a certain political point of view. So uh, anyone, if you want to address how it will have effect to the, you know, the politics. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I? Oh, yes. oh, great, great research. Just a couple of questions, maybe I just missed them. One was uh, why some of the most poorest country in ASEAN was not included in it, like Myanmar and Laos, would have been an obvious miss there. The, the 
I, I think you had spot on uh, things identified uh, informal sector, the fear and all that, that's brilliant. But my question is, because this is not going to be the last pandemic, there'll be more coming. So what is you suggest people should be doing, the people who are policy makers, the ones who manage it. This time again, I, I lived during pandemic in three different countries. China, when it started, I was there. Very different approach. Fear was the main factor. Lockdown put them there. Then went to another country. Again, the same thing. Uh, fear was the main driver. So what do we need to do? as? because this was the most researched uh, element. And I think uh, technology where it uh, was brought in, it was helpful for the marginalized. It was the worst thing which could have happened because they were always left out. If that was happening, I wouldn't have woke up at uh, five o'clock even to try because I know I can't make it to two, th two million people amongst the 55 million here. So just a uh, few thoughts here. Hello, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, it's uh, related with the, <clears throat> the last speaker's question, excuse me. <clears throat> um, is there any attempt to, in any country, to have a holistic survey of who was missed and how to catch uh, these gaps, how to fill, close the gaps <clears throat> in coverage uh, in, for, in future uh, public health emergencies? and do we, uh, the other aspect of that is if we have not learned from the AIDS problem uh, how, or applied our learning for there for this one, is there any hope that we can address the problems uh, that we've understand and researched in COVID for another public health disaster? It's, it, it, it's such a complex picture in every country with every government and, and different societies. Uh, so, if we we have to know who we've missed, and there has to be some way to approach the coverage to effect sort of effectively um, bring us through the emergency, so that we don't have all these problems. Uh, I don't know if you can answer any of that. Thank you. I think we have three, and then one more uh, question. Yes. Hi. Yes. Thank you. Great panel. I have two questions, one for the university specialists and in health. It's it's very simple question, but it was uh, it take, take my attention about the low rate of death officially by country on the region. So it's, it's very paradox, like you say, this amount of effort to lock down, close borders, uh, you know, separate people by conditions, et cetera. And then you have this kind of uh, data that is officially, I suppose, uh, of zero deaths, like in some countries that we know that is far for uh, being true, or, or the, the one year that Laos stay for one case for I don't know how long, and we know cases coming from the borders in other sides of the region with people coming from Laos, movement of immigrants uh, getting tests and getting positive. So what are the real numbers of deaths in the region for COVID-19? That's my first question. And the second one is more related on, we saw China and all these crises that came after the political crisis who came after because of the economic crisis that it was caused by the health crisis of covid uh, do we do you have any any panelists can re respond on that any reading on that that we see any effect in other countries that you study in the book that can be affected on this like the numbers the data that you are saying how these uh, inequalities came more stronger and and more difficult, especially for some uh, areas of and, and people of the society. You talk about informal sector, uh, sex worker, uh, women in different sectors. Uh, do you see any crisis that it's been not reading uh, or maybe not uh, being caused by uh, the health crisis, but maybe there are some 
you know, what is the reading of um, some effects on the political level, maybe, or economic level in other, in other countries. Thank you. And uh, congratulations you. for the book. Thank you. So there are some question about the facts, the situation, and some question about how do we deal or what could we do with the future, right? This requires a lot of uh, another one hour times. I think you need to read the book Yeah, for a lot of this if you really want to know. On the zombie, I think we already have a lot of zombie, even we saw before COVID in political scenes. So I don't worry too much about the zombie. Uh, I think it's very, uh, we wanted to do the research on Myanmar. Actually, the sixth country, the sixth country was Myanmar. But because of the coup made impossible to do research in Myanmar then, so we took the country with the most serious pandemic situation in Southeast Asia, the largest number of cases, etc. And those included Myanmar at the time. And then we couldn't do Myanmar, we changed it to Vietnam, which at the time seemed to be doing well, but later on, it became one of the worst country in Southeast Asia. So the, unfortunately, the situation in Myanmar, I talk about that in the regional chapter. So it is mentioned how the political and economic situation influenced the, the pandemic in Myanmar. There is a number of literature, including study by Ben and ILO and others on Myanmar, but it's only in the regional chapter. We couldn't do a research because the value of this book, which has not come out because we have not talked about methodology is there are interviews with people during the COVID pandemic. So all the country have had interviews, not only literature. Uh, so I think this is really the, the value of, of this book. On the data, uh, the data we know is not, but this is all over the world. The data on COVID are not reliable. They have been political data, including in Thailand, including in many countries, they have tried to say there is less than, but we know the excess debt, what we call excess debt, and this is in the book, is quite high for our country in Southeast Asia. Uh, Indonesia was in denial totally at the beginning of the pandemic, later on still continue to be in denial. Thailand, I think, played with number when they say there were no local infection, while actually probably there were. And so I think the data, we need to take it really with assault and we need to look at the excess debt for those uh, data. And then you will get a more comprehensive view of the real. And of course, people have counted how many dead there have been in a cemetery in Jakarta, for instance. And then you know that the official figures are not, it's only a, a portion of what really has happened. I think I take this to, there are many other important points, but uh, in the interest in time, I think read the book. And uh, I'm going to take a few points as well. When you asked about the public health, uh, uh, I think those who have some public health, uh, public health background, you study epidemiology. And from the television, from the news, you would, uh, when you hear about the numbers of the uh, new, new, uh, new cases, you would, you would know instantly that, like, well, they lie to our faces because, because what? Because when you talk about the you know, declining numbers of patients, we have to ask, like, how many people you, are you provide testing? Because the number that you found depends on the number of the testing that you provide. So if you don't spend much of the effort getting people tested, of course, the number, the number is going down. So uh, so when you get a test more, the number goes up. So this is basic epidemiology. And uh, and and there are uh, and but but the thing is that um, there is one tel uh, Thai television uh, news anchor who questions about the uh, why don't gov uh, why didn't government report the number of the testing provided to the people on reporting the number of cases. But I know that, uh, the next day that she was asked not to repeat that statement again, because the uh, people would know that the, uh, eventually the government actually does not provide accurate information. And um, another point is the, um, um, I think the, in terms of the, uh, what, what we should do after this, because this is not our, our last pandemic. I think, first of all, it's clear that the uh, the current uh, policy in terms of the uh, social protection is not adequate or is not effective because uh, it's meant to prevent the uh, disasters like this. You know, people falling into poverty overnight. 
so it does not cover people at the bottom uh, bottom, uh, bottom, uh, bottom group of the socioeconomic status. It only benefits maybe people in the middle class and the higher class. And how do we solve it? We, may, we might have to challenge the status quo of the taxation. Like, um, but there, but it's the uh, this is a political issues. How come the people at the uh, at the top of the socioeconomic classes who are uh, uh, parliamentarians, senators, uh, legislate the uh, the, uh, the the laws to deduct more uh, to uh, to uh, to force them to pay more taxes? It's very uh, it's uh, you know that you know that it's very un very unlikely, but. Uh, but the, uh, we have a lot of the uh, studies showing that the uh, at least in Thailand we have a very unfair uh, uh, taxation pro uh, uh, process where people at the uh, middle class and lower class they are paid more tax. So, uh, but we uh, but if we uh, call, if we challenge that kind of status quo, we might have the more money, more uh, more money to you know to make sure that the uh, we have uh, more effective social protection policies. Yeah, just a short point. Um, in terms of what we need, I, I think um, Benjamin has alluded to it, and I, I would say it's a radical political change because the principles are there. You know, uh, the ILO has a decent work strategy. The UN has set out what economic, social, and cultural rights everyone should have, but they're just not being implemented. As somebody who worked in the NGO sector, Every year, I feel like we just cut and paste our recommendations over and over and over again. So if we don't have the political change, then it won't happen. And not, it's not because we don't know. The demands are being made all the time by civil societies, just that we're not being heard. Yeah, I mean, just on the last point of the policy question in terms of what, what could be done to prepare for future pandemics. I mean, I think what you see, I mean, we work a lot with ASEAN. What you end up seeing is sort of a lot of awareness that there needs to be preparation and sort of lip service to making those preparations rather than taking the sort of more concrete uh, policy steps to prepare. So you get ASEAN declarations. There's one now just came out my uh, protection of migrants in crisis situations which yes i mean it's a political um commitment to to provide greater support but then you know all of these things are sort of left up to the decision of national governments the extent to which they will actually implement them so you have a lot of sort of um political maneuvering to, we know this is a problem we know we need to be better prepared uh, but sort of little substantive action um, in terms of practical policy measures that will prepare people on the ground for future pandemics to happen. So sorry if that's sort of a dark point, but I, I, I don't see a lot of practical action being done at the moment. Uh, add one thing. I mean, a, a very small uh, step forward is let's get segregated data right according to economic status according to gender we have been saying this for ages we still don't know maybe there's some government have it but they don't publish if we would have access that of course would help to build the kind of arguments that we are making and to advocate and to insist. I mean, the issue of gender uh, segregated data of that tell us how many women have lost the job, how many have not, et cetera, et cetera, or even how many were sick, maybe more men were sick, right? That would be also, it seems that in some country, but the analysis like they do in the United States that people that are black were more affected and they had less service, we would not be able to really do it here. So just let's just start it with that. That already would be a big uh, progress and it would indeed sustain a lot of the arguments that that we have made. So I think that so we don't need to think only about the big picture. While we think about the big picture, we can work a very concrete steps of things that can be done. At least to measure first, right? We have, yeah, so very last. I think we don't have time, but very short. Yeah. Comment? Yeah, so congratulations, Leah. 
and to your team here, Ben and everyone. It's a fantastic presentation and a very important book, I think. Um, so we don't want to finish on this gloomy note that you know the government is not going to do anything. There's not going to be any desegregated data. So Rapid Asia has just done a very big study in Thailand on migrant workers and the impact of COVID. That's coming out very, very soon. So watch that space. But my question for you is, we talk about migrant workers. I, I would think that employers play a very important role. They are in daily contact with these workers. Could you just, as a final note, comment, what do you think can employers, because in, in the study we did, we could see that employers play a very, very important role in informing workers, making sure they're vaccinated or tested and whatever, much more than, for example, what the public, um, you know, the public health department can do. Could you comment something on that? Well, if you ask me, but then later on, <laughs> they can. Uh, I would not want to have the worker dependent on the employers. Let's be sure, because we know also, yes, some employer are very good, but some other are not, and they are keeping the document. They were. We know, for instance, that the one that uh, employed the the seal and bubble and seal approach was also done with the support of employers, and then the employer. I will not mention which employer is, but then was going there uh, to offer some food after they closed them into the dormitory and get some PR for the good deed that they were doing with the employer. So the employer are extremely important. For sure, they need to be engaged, but there needs to be enforcement of measures. You know, and uh, what I think Ben is is really the the accept that the migrants are here as an integral part of Thai society. We need to have a discussion of integration of migrants. There is no any discussion at the moment about integration of migrants. So that is the first step. Until it is accepted that then, then they would be taken proper care. Yeah. No integration of migrants integration so that they are really part of thai society is not only for coming here one year and go back to their country so all this issue linked to very uh, deep uh, discussion i mean it cannot be just a small solution of engaging employer or not engaging employer or engaging other party we need really to look and start to deconstruct some of this uh, policy that is mine but i will give to the more moderate member of the teams so um in terms of the uh, focusing on the employers i think you're right they are the uh, key uh, the most one of the most what you call a uh, crucial uh, uh factor or a uh, factor that uh, we need to work with actually i and uh, dr tria nong who's uh, she is also an expert in working with migrant workers and we have been working together for for years and a number of projects and we try to reach out to the uh, there are so many uh, there were so many projects that reach out to the uh, employers and uh, what happened is that you know that the foundations uh the found the, uh, the foundation that the uh, employers hire migrant workers because they want to minimize the cost. So it's the purely business. So they are not they were not thinking about the human rights or giving opportunities for those who might not have the opportunities and then come to work in Thailand. They're not really like a well witching like that because they want to minimize the cost. So when we ask for their like further contribution, they are uh, the, the furthest that we could go is that they only uh, they were willing to sacrifice one day of the uh, of their uh, of their workers to be to volunteer for the uh, uh, pro, uh, project to and uh, to provide maybe health information to their peers only only that but more but more extensive engagement from the employers they are very reluctant to um uh, you know to join the work because they said that they may have not time they're not interested and also they want to show up their face and they and the the the, the what do you call the mindset of the human rights or helping each other was very minimal and then the uh, but 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 criticizing uh, uh in in the open like this um could could actually uh put things worse so we we may have to find the what do you call uh, a new strategies to work with them but so far we haven't been successful um and uh, to, to to be uh, to truth be told 
Stephanie? Yeah, so, so it's true that employers have a outsized role um, and power over migrant workers. Um, but I think I generally agree with uh, Rosalia that it's problematic to depend on the goodwill of employers vis-a-vis uh, -vis regulation. In Singapore, what sometimes happens is that the state policies turn employers into further tools of discipline over migrant workers because through monetary or other policies, they get fined or punished if migrant workers do not abide by certain regulations. So then employers then um, become tools of surveillance to make sure that the migrant workers don't break certain laws. So they become even more coercive in that sense. Um, so I think to depend on goodwill of employers would make things a bit too unpredictable for migrant workers, although it is true that if employers had the collective power and the will to change things, then 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 maybe more could be done in certain way. But we we don't we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. Uh, just very briefly, I mean, I think um, yeah, employers have an important role to play for sure. Uh, I think the issue is that you know what is often put in place to get employers to take action, sort of reliant on just them exercising goodwill rather than sort of adhering to more binding commitments to protect their workers. And in, in particular, when we're talking about migrant workers, which is a big part of the issue here in Thailand, you know, they cannot organize into their own trade unions to assert their rights in a way that would ensure that employers had to respect you know their their rights and provide them with social protection etc so that's really the mechanism for workers to demand their rights and i don't think it's enough to just to sort of expect that workers will employers will do the right thing to protect their workers you really need sort of binding mechanisms whether it's law whether it's unions collectively bargaining for better conditions to make sure that employers treat their workers properly. Thanks. Well, um, I look at the watch and it's now beyond the time. So I think we would like to thank all the speakers and, and the commentators as well as all the questions. I think we have covered a very important topic something that will probably shape our future as well as reflecting on what we had done uh, if we look back actually covid was a was a new disease a lot of unknowns very complex initially but there are so many things that shouldn't happen or the many other things that should have happened right if we go back to the the question of this research project or the the base of the book have decisions on governing the pandemic been oriented to the for the common good, or more importantly, was enough done to ensure the welfare of those marginalized in our societies, especially the poor and the socially excluded, been done? And, and we have some glimpse of the answer from what been presented and discussed. The deeper question we heard is, what can we do better? Have there been any changes that been implemented? I would say that there's some changes already done, but probably not enough. And many of them are linked to structural problem. We discuss about tax issue, finance. In the region, I think we're probably one of the lowest tax in terms of proportion of the GDP. And there are also other issues about values, about what Ben was ask, ben asking, who, who are deserving all this, right? And, and those values and, and thinking underlying uh, 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 what we have in our society probably will be something that need a bit longer term than just a, a quick answer to this very complex, very, uh, uh, what do you call, a lot of things in world politics was mentioned, economic was mentioned and, and many others. So I think we have a lot to still continue to work together towards the, the thing, the society we want to see the more more what we call better welfare for those, especially the one who are marginalized and socially excluded. And, and at least I, I'm very, 
very uh, what do you call very glad and very happy to see many of you who are very very concerned about this issue and and I see a good opportunity for us to really move forward. So thank you so much for all of you and thank you again to Leah especially for this uh, uh, both the research and also the place Si Junction as a venue for our dialogues and longer term movement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Pia for uh, moderating and of course Ben also for the very uh, articulated review of, of the book. And uh, to celebrate, please enjoy the Indonesian food. Uh, it's the slamatan, so it's yellow rice, which is used to celebrate happy events. And so you, this is for sure a very happy events and productive. So please go and enjoy and we can continue uh, to talk. And at the same time, of course, on your way out, give a donation if you can and promote uh, this book as much as you can. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's start, let's start.